doing it for a while. Oh, here we go. We are we are live. Excellent. Um, well, hi everybody. This is Klaus Ehlers, um, CEO of Family Promise, and this is Klaus in 60 Seconds live on Facebook, which is not 60 seconds, but 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> um, and uh, and you know, if you've been watching these, it's I'm having a ton of fun. I just get to talk to just such really amazing folks. Analyzing McCoy is my guest today, who is just awesome. She is the executive director of outreach and training, outreach training and research at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That's a mouthful, right? <laughs> it is. It is. Um, and, and Eliza and I, we met a number of years ago. Um, uh, one of our affiliates had a connection, had been working a little bit, and we talked, and we realized what a great uh, synergy there was because both of our organizations are focused on securing children, um, and uh, and the work that the National Center for Missing and exploited children, or NICMIC, as it's uh, as we call it, um, uh, is of course the premier organization addressing those issues. So we're going to talk a little bit about the interplay between child safety and some of the specific elements wow. around children uh, at risk of homelessness. And I think the place to start is NICMIC is probably most famous for uh, high-profile issues like child abduction right. and so on. Um, but that is only a small part of really the incredible scope of the organization. So, Eliza, you want to just kind of help people understand the real, the full scope of what Nick Mick does? Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you for having me here today. It's exciting to, to see you on screen and be able to have this conversation. Um, National Center did begin um, over 30 years ago, really, to help find missing children. And over the years, our mission has expanded. We now also work to prevent child sexual exploitation online, as well as other types of victimization of children. And so in the last year alone, we assisted in more than 27,000 cases of missing children. We took more than 18 million reports of online child sexual exploitation, and our safety resources were distributed to over 4.2 million kids and families through partnerships like we have with Family Promise. Yeah, and talk a little bit about the, the, the materials that you distribute, that last point that you made, because I think that's a really important one. What is that? What does that involve? What is some of that training and so on that you guys do? Absolutely. We have a lot of resources available to kids, families, as well as child serving professionals in lots of different formats. So we have NICMEC Connect, which is an online training portal for professionals and other adults and trusted adults for children to learn about our issues, as well as best practices and how to prevent them. We also have a tremendous amount of online safety resources like tip sheets and community presentations, and even an animated web series for kids under the age of 10 at netsmartswithaz.org. Um, and in addition, we have a personal safety Safety program for kids called Kids Smarts. All of these can be found at missingkids.org/education. But there's just a tremendous variety. We try to do it in an age-appropriate way, um, and really focus on the positive empowerment of kids and families to address these issues. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's such an important point. Is just the education work that you do, yeah. right? I think you know again, people are sort of in the in the in the imagination. You're about kind of swooping in rescue <laughs> or incredibly important and all, but it's just that, you know, it's that education that prevents, yes. that minimizes risk. And, you know, and on that note, um, part, of, part of the reason it's so important that we work together is that children and families that are housing unstable, that have a lot of stressors on them are at more risk. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Absolutely. I mean, we certainly know that, particularly with child sexual exploitation, there are tremendous economic drivers. I mean, children are victimized in all of these different forms more often by people they know, whether mm -hmm. it's family members or people in their circle of trust, like a coach or a mentor. And so the reasons behind that exploitation is usually to secure some type of need. And usually that need is financial. So a family member may offer a child for victimization in order to get rent covered or to get food on their table. And so that can be, you know, an extremely difficult um, layered vulnerability that we really have to address. I, we talk about a lot in my team asking the five whys of any, um, any challenge that we see in our society. And the fact is, if you really go back to the whys of this type of victimization, we have to look at things like housing insecurity, food instability, and other economic factors that create levels of need and stress on family and children. And I think also de facto, when you've got families that are struggling, where mom is working two jobs as a single parent, you just you simply just have, you know, fewer layers around that child to to protect them as well. Right. Um, you know, besides sort of these other dynamics that come into play, 
um, I think a really Im important work that you have done is is in the digital world because um, when I was you know when I was a kid there was no internet <laughs> so on uh, you know and even when my kids were young you know they were you know they had computers but you know my kids weren't they, like they didn't get phones until they were older teenagers right. uh, you know really different world now it has changed so much and um, you know. What are your what what is your kind of sense and advice in terms of the digital world we have right now, particularly for for parents of younger children? Yeah, I mean, the digital world right now is overwhelming, um, and, and more so for certain generations than others. For some of us, like you indicated, it's still new. Others, it is literally how we grew up <laughs> or are continuing to grow up. And the important part is to remember that I think in the same ways that we evolved from stranger danger and teaching stranger danger to instead talking about healthy relationships and consent, that we have to speak positively about how we can be safe online, both as adults and kids. You know, and, and modeling behavior as adults, as well as having open and active conversation with your children about how they operate in the online world, because we can learn from them while we're also answering their questions and working through those kind of practicing of skills. Um, so I, I encourage parents above all else to ask questions. If you don't know what platforms are out there that your kids are using, or you heard some funny name like TikTok and you want to know more about it, ask your kids and do it in moments when when you're, you know, eating at the table or driving in the car. You know, it doesn't have to be the sit down talk. Uh, it can just be sort of a regular part of your conversation about what they did today, because I'm sure they've spent hours online um, as we do. And I think then it's also about positioning yourself as a trusted adult for any type of re reporting, letting kids know that if something does happen to them, you're there to react responsibly and, and get them help. And there are two ways to reach us. Uh, our hotline is 1-800-THE-LOST. And then we have an online reporting hotline called cybertipline.org. And let those kids give those kids that skill as well. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to tell you, but they should talk to somebody. And so I think it's important to be having both of those conversations. If you're not a parent, talk to the kids in your life that are your mentee or someone in your, your Sunday school or faith-based you know, community, um, because we all are eyes and ears for our children's safety, no matter whether we have kids or not. I, I, that's, that is terrific. And I think there's three points I wanted to pick up on that you, you talked about that really are a are, are real dynamic. So one is, you know, coming more from a positive standpoint, because obviously we're online all the time. Yeah. So it's not like being online is evil and dangerous, at, you know, as its default. You know, we like to we like to do that. And I think I think that's part of the problem in our society is that we over vilify things and we yes. simplify it and ignore the fact that there's a there's a reason why we're online all the time, because we get a lot from it. Yes. That's and actually then, one thing that we say in our covid tip sheet specifically is the answer is not to take away tech because kids, just like adults, we as humans crave connection and technology provides that. So we can't take away connection entirely um, for that reason. So I wholeheartedly agree with that, not being a black and white, you know, have or don't have, but learn how to use in a positive way. And and it ties into the, to the second point that you made, right, about conversation and just being very realistic about it. And I think, right, what I'm hearing you say is, you know, with your kids, talk about how you use technology and find what are those commonalities with how they use technology, right? You're using technology mm -hmm. to communicate, to learn, to, to stay in connection with a community as they are. Yeah. And there's good ways and bad ways to do that as there is with everything. Yep. Right. I mean, exactly. you know, it's a great thing, but if you're if you're jamming the toothbrush in your eye, it's really not. So <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, the bottom line is we have to 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 balance exactly those two things. That there is a positive online environment that exists that still has risks, but we manage risk all the time mm -hmm. in our real lives and outside, yeah. and we're constantly teaching kids that. You know, just like with driving, we don't just put them in the front seat of the car and say, "Okay, bye." <laughs> you know, they have to go through a period of education. And we're teaching them car safety from the minute we put them in a car seat when they're little. And we're saying, it's my responsibility as your mother to put you in a car seat. And this is why, because it can be dangerous in a car. And from that point forward, you have a conversation about car safety their entire lives. Yep. And we should do the same thing with online safety. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it because I, that's, I, I think something I get frustrated by when people are very reductionist. And, mm -hmm. and I think you see, you know, and, and not, not, not to veer too much into the political world, but you see things being said right now that I think are, are so horrifically counterproductive because as you said, the, the greatest 
risk of exploitation and so on is by a trusted yeah. adult within yep. a family. That's where the danger is. Uh, it, it, I'll just, I'll, I'm going to go off on a little tangent. Years <laughs> ago, I worked for um, a, a cancer publication and um, they did this study about um, magazines targeted towards women, you know, like Glamour and so on, and how they would run these articles about cancer from all these obscure sources <laughs> and then have you know, Virginia Slim's ads on the back. They never run <laughs> anything about tobacco and cancer, you know? And so sometimes we actually are counterproductive when we, mm -hmm. we, we create these, these big things about danger, ignoring what the real dangers are. Right. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned COVID and, um, you know, the, the COVID era, the pandemic, the, the, the shift that we've made, the fact that our children are online de facto when they're six years old, whether we wanted them to be or not, because that's how they're going to school. What are the, the what are your biggest concerns, um, you know, around sort of the shift that we've made because of the COVID era? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the greatest ones is we just know with increased access, there's increased opportunity for bad actors. Um, and, and, and those bad actors, again, don't necessarily have to be strangers, right? Even if it's a teacher in an inappropriate relationship, now that teacher is online more than they ever have been with your child before um, and can do so in ways that are more private than, than ever before. You know, we have seen in our online enticement reports, so that's where a child is convinced online to do something inappropriate or to meet in person. Person, they've um, gone up 100% from last year in wow. the same time period. And the reports overall for any type of online child sexual exploitation has increased about 63%. So the more we're online, the more reports we're seeing. Um, and, and again, a large portion of those reports can be attributed to people trying to be helpful to, to seeing an inappropriate video of a child and wanting to put it out there to identify an offender. And so we've had a lot of, we've had to do a lot of educational effort around around the best thing to do being to report, not to share. Yeah. And that I think, frankly, we didn't expect. I mean, we love, I mean, we know kids come home and we find kids and offenders, the more people are looking for them. But we didn't expect that viral videos would then overwhelm our call center, our reporting um, agencies to, to be able to get those reports out of, of kids. And so that, that was a real unexpected challenge for us and a, a real pivot educationally that we had to do um, from an outreach standpoint. Um, so definitely positive, but certainly just not something that that we expected. Um, but I also think that the online saturation has made for um, a continuing teachable moment between between adults and kids. Right. Um, there's no way to get around technology these days. So guess what? It's super easy to bring it up because <laughs> you're just you're doing it all the time anyway. Yeah. And so I, I I really appreciate that opportunity. And I think similarly, you know, I'm a single working mom and I'm around my kids a lot more than I ever was when I was working out of the home. And so it does allow more opportunities to ask those questions or to sit down next to them or try and do, you know, a video together or play a game. So there's there's major benefits that have also come from this at home. Uh, yeah, that, that's pandemic. a great point, Eliza, right? Because yeah, you're, you are present with your kids more. And you're present with your kids in a way that you'd never been because we all right. know, because we all went, were kids that went to school, that our lives at school and what we showed our parents were right. different things in very right. different ways. Right. And it right. is harder to, you know, so it, you know, it, as, as difficult as these times are, there are, there are these realignments yes. that are really our opportunity. So let me, let me ask you this last question. Um, you know, if, if if you were able to sort of make changes, policy changes, kind of sweeping changes, <laughs> what are the changes you think we need to have? Right? What? It, what and, and particularly as we have this rapid evolution of our society in all these different ways, what are the things you think need to be changed to better protect children, specifically? from exploitation and, uh, and and abuse. Ma'am, where do I begin? You're really giving me carte blanche here. <laughs> for a platform. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, ultimately, I, I would really like to see that we talk about this type of victimization as a public health issue. Mm -hmm. um, we know that public health approaches that have worked are the ones that are positive and empowering. I mean, and so talking about um, children and boundaries and consent and healthy relationships. I would really like to see a lot more support and motivation for those types of programs. And again, programs that address the underlying and layered vulnerabilities of mental health, substance abuse, economic instability. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we need to start treating the illness, not just the symptoms. 
And I think that is one of the things that those of us who have been in child protection for the last, you know, 20 years, we've seen tremendous progress in that direction, but we're, we're still not there. We're still not treating this type of victimization of kids as a, as a public health emergency in the way that it should be and have the amount of support and drive for coordinated and collaborative prevention efforts across disciplines, you know, not just investigative tools for law enforcement, but also, um, support and resources for community serving organizations and um, educational programs and schools and a really multi-pronged approach. So that's what I would really advocate for at this point and would love to see even more progress in that in the, in the years to come. That's, yeah, that's great. And I think you know, this, this is a theme that we sound a lot in these conversations, which is you have the, you know, the obvious profound human cost, but treating child exploitation and abuse the way we do is incredibly fiscally counterproductive. Right. It's a short-term Band-Aid for yeah. what are long-term fixes that are needed to see any movement in the needle, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, you know, we certainly know that there are so many professionals out there on the front lines thinking and working like that. And we really, we consider ourselves an organization that is here to equip them with the right data, the right resources, the right insights into the dynamics of this victimization to help do that. Um, and and we, we know it's dependent on that type of advocacy to think bigger, think longer, think larger. And, and having been at your headquarters, I, I, I mean, it is it, actually the old one and the new one. Yeah, it, it is incredible. You know, I, I don't think people realize just the, the, the magnitude of, of the work that you guys do and that you really are, you know, you're not a federal agency, but you almost feel right. like this, this elite federal agency in, in the way that you guys uh, tackle the issue. I, I thank you so much for everything that you do um, thank you. In, in that area. Um, anything else you wanted to, to say before we um, we hit the weekend? No, I mean, I really would just like to really call out how proud I am of, of our partnership and the two organizations, because I think it represents how we think creatively about keeping kids safe from different perspectives and different angles. And um, that's exactly the, the type of collaboration that we need to see to see change. So I appreciate being on. You're about the only person I would get on Facebook for at four o'clock on a Friday. So <laughs> thanks for having me. It's been great talking to you. Thanks, Eliza. I appreciate it so no much. Problem. Well, um, this was awesome. Um, and yeah, everybody, I mean, definitely look at, uh, you know, go to missingkids.org, learn yep. more about the organization. If you're involved, if you're involved with Family Promise, make sure you're taking full advantage of the resources that we have with, with NICMIC. And if you're with another nonprofit organization, uh, or any kind of child serving organization, just make sure you're connected, you're utilizing those resources. At, at the very least, we can just simply make sure that the people we serve have access to it. Uh, it is just a, a, a tremendously um, valuable resource. So Eliza, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank uh, you, you too, stay well. Likewise, all right, bye everybody. Bye.